right. Well, welcome to Roots of Reality Experiences. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Leila Hashemi, who is a researcher and data analyst at the Terrorism, Transnational Crime, and Corruption Center at George Mason University. Dr. Hashemi research focuses on international supply chains, cybercrime, and the illicit trade of counterfeit drugs and more. Lastly, Dr. Hashemi is the managing editor of the Journal of Civil Society and has been published in the Washington Post as well as in various academic journals and books. So thank you for coming on today. Thanks so much for having me, Ben. So how did you first get interested in the world of illicit trade? That's a great question. So I originally got into illicit trade as a PhD student at George Mason University. So I got my PhD in 2020. And I started working at the Terrorism, Transnational Crime and Corruption Center. So I have a wonderful advisor, Dr. Louise Shelley, who works on all things transnational crime, anything from human trafficking, wildlife trafficking. Um, the first sort of project that I worked on at TRAC was looking at antiquity smuggling out of Iraq and Syria. And so we actually have a book that just came out on this topic, um, which I'm happy to send your listeners a link to. Um, and have just been hooked ever since. Um, so I've worked on that project and then currently I'm working on a National Science Foundation grant looking at illicit supply chain of personal protective equipment, PPE, and illicit pharmaceuticals. Okay, wow. So clearly there's a lot of uh, things that are being traded around the world illegally, unfortunately. <laughs> um, now, Counterfeit drugs seems to be a, a big problem also because your health is at risk as well if you're taking drugs that you need and you end up getting a hold of fake drugs. Um, so how did you, when did you first get involved with uh, sort of analyzing the counterfeit drug world? Yeah, I think a lot of tracks work look specifically at the opioid epidemic in the U.S., but also globally. And so just seeing the devastation that's caused by this and how many deaths have happened, like for instance, just between uh, 2020 and 2021, we have over 100,000 deaths in the United States, which just seemed like a really um, timely topic to get into. And then just seeing how it impacts public health, um, essentially national security in a lot of senses, and then also just the social and economic impacts are really important to me um, in terms of not just opioids, but all sorts of, um, you know, like steroids, any other kinds of um, medications and things like this. And then I've been particularly really interested in counterfeiting because it's the largest criminal enterprise in the world. So counterfeits in general, and, uh, well, I should say counterfeits and pirated goods, uh, total $1.7 trillion per year. Um, and in 2018, our poll seized over 13 million doses of counterfeit drugs. That's worth over $180 million. And so that's just the financing of one sector in one particular region. Um, but then I'm also really interested in the idea that these big products really harm the reputations of brands and their partners. So, um, you know, the idea that trademarks are being infringed or abused. And then really what we do, a lot of our work at track, I should say, focuses on the convergence of all these different forms of, of crime. So how counterfeits fund other forms of illicit trade, um, and how they threaten to harm consumers through circulation of substandard products in legitimate supply chains. Wow, okay. So it's it's obviously a, a pretty big problem internationally. Um, where are counterfeit drugs usually being manufactured at? Yeah, that's a really great question. So I think when it comes to where we're, where pharma has come from, it depends on what we're talking about. But generally we're seeing that uh, especially a lot of the newer synthetic drugs are being manufactured in China, more broadly Asia, um, sometimes in India to a less, lesser extent in India. Um, and this is often done in sort of rural areas, so kind of making the distinction between what we think of tr as traditional medicines versus synthetics that are manufactured. And then um, we'll often go through various transit points along the way and then their destination markets typically will be in the sort of developed world um, in the United States and in Europe. Okay. Wow. And so um, how are these things being shipped and, and spreading around the world? And, and you know, how, I guess, 
how easy is it to get a hold of counterfeit drugs than by accident if you're just shopping in the normal marketplace and in different countries around the world? Yeah, so I think that um, it's their very complex supply chain. So criminals being criminals, they try to sort of adapt their transport and shipping methods to avoid detection, right? And so sure. when we look sure. at the sort of total or sort of holistic supply chain, when we see the sort of trade routes from Asia, oftentimes through Central and South America into the United States, at every node you can kind of see um, the involvement of warehouses, storage facilities. Um, a lot of times we see the involvement of free trade zones that have very sort of lax regulations, not a lot of, um, you know, you don't have to pay taxes, you don't have to really report a lot of the products that are being um, transported through these free trade zones uh, or free zones. And so this is a perfect opportunity at these transshipment points to sort of longer product, meaning, um, falsifying the bill of lading, falsifying invoices, um, creating false documents, um, anything from just sort of like misspelling or using um, the harmonized system, so HS codes that define what a, what a product is, um, they will just be mislabeled as something else. We also see a lot of um, gray market with uh, medicines and pharmaceuticals. And what I mean by that is a mixing of licit and illicit goods. So mixing together legal goods with illegal goods to avoid detection. So packaging something in a bunch of, I don't know, wood or styrofoam or whatever it might be, and then putting the illicit goods, um, obfuscating them with legal goods. So there's just seems like, I guess, countless ways that you can hide these things. And it's, it's almost impossible then to keep track of them all, I guess, because you would probably slow the supply chain down tremendously if you were to search, you know, so thoroughly that you could possibly find things hidden within other things. And it just seems like kind of an impossible task. Um, so how do countries go about trying to combat something like this? Yeah, so it's, it's difficult to do in the sort of globalized world, right? Like a lot of these drugs are intended for a particular market. And so um, actually what we see a lot of is authentic diverted product. And so what that means is that a product might be legal or not illegal, for instance, in a market like China or India, and then they are then sold to an unintended market in another country. Um, so yeah. in that way, we're able to avoid the regulations, the country level regulations, because technically that product was not illegal when it was first manufactured. And so we do see a lot of these global supply chains that um, allow these products to be shipped to other countries. In terms of what national regulations are happening, uh, a lot of it is training law enforcement, training customs officials, um, also working with the medical community to make sure that they are able to distinguish fake from authentic products. And so a lot of times that involves working with brands, working with subject matter experts, because the problem with counterfeiting is that the root of the problem is being able to distinguish what is a false product versus what is an authentic product. And yeah. so many of these products are so specific. Um, and specialized that working with the manufacturer or the brand that produces them is one of the best routes forward. Wow, okay. So yeah, I guess uh, you have to have kind of a, a whole sophisticated army of people sort of on top of this to, to the <laughs> control it and try to stop it from happening in the first place. Uh, what are the most common counterfeit drugs and medical devices being produced then? Right, so that's a really good question. I think this, um, it really points to this discrepancy between what we see in the developing world and the developed world. Um, globally, we see antibiotics as being one of the most counterfeit or commonly counterfeited drugs, particularly in low-income nations. And so this all kind of stems from the fact that we have up to 2 billion people around the world that lack access to necessary medicines and vaccines. Sure. Um, and then sure. in the United States, we see a lot of counterfeit drugs that are manufactured to mimic drugs prescribed for the treatment of chronic diseases, such as um, we see a lot of erectile dysfunction. <laughs> uh, so like Viagra's or ED medication, that's probably tough up there in, in terms of um, medicines, but also, you know, medicines for high cholesterol, hypertension, also antibiotics, 
um, even, even medicines that treat cancer um, of HIV and AIDS. And we also see a huge flood in quantity and diversity of what we call NPS or new psychoactive substances. And so these can be kind of broken down into four categories. So we see synthetic stimulants, synthetic cannabinoids, synthetic hallucinogens, and then synthetic depressants, which include uh, opioids. Okay. So uh, I guess you said oftentimes these things are being produced in sort of low or middle income nations um, and they're being distributed abroad, but how big of an issue are counterfeit drugs within those nations themselves that are producing them? Like, is it, you know, I, I imagine that, okay, if they're able to get shipped to the broad, you know, how, how big of a problem though is it actually in those countries that they're being produced? You know, are people every day struggling to even find, you know, what drug is actually legitimate and which one has just been manufactured as a fake? Yeah, well, I think that also kind of speaks to your question earlier about like how easy is it to access these drugs? And I think it also speaks to the complexity of this globalized supply chain because the even just in the manufacturing, when we come, when we start from sort of our like precursor powdered chemical to the final pill form, that can also cross a bunch of different countries. And um, to the to the point of like how easy is it to find these medicines? pretty easy, right? So on our grant, we're looking at both open web and um, dark web sales of these medicines. And you would think that because these are criminal acts that the actors would be using to the dark web, right? Cryptocurrencies, you need some sort of like tech uh, skill to be able to access the market. But um, most of my research is actually focusing on the open web and you can just Google like buy fentanyl online or buy Xanax and find websites that will sell you these products or these medicines without a prescription, which is generally what we're trying to do is to have you know, regulated markets and processes to get these medicines to people. Um, and then I think really what's important is the, the rise in these synthetics because when we talk about the legality of them, these synthetics essentially serve as loopholes for producers to stay ahead of any of these national level regulations. So they manufacture and distribute products that are similar to existing drugs, but they're just enough chemically different to avoid any sort of detection or disruption. Um, and they're also particularly dangerous because they're easier and cheaper to manufacture than, like I was saying before, what we see is like traditional drugs like opium or heroin. With those products, you require land, a lot of agricultural resources, much more extensive sort of labor um, versus synthetics that are produced in labs or rural areas and can be mass produced with much fewer resources. Um, so again, these uh, new psychoactive substances um, are being manufactured in China and to a less, lesser extent in India. I think that rise in th synthetics really demonstrates the need to address the supply chain or like the initial parts of the supply chain, but also harm reduction. So when you're saying how, how big are these problems nationally, um, in the Asian market, generally, from my understanding, there are very high pen penalties for possession or use of these drugs. Um, but then it, it really just depends um, country to country um, as to how, what the punishments or sort of availability is. But at the same time, because we have these new synthetics, uh, the criminals are kind of always stay, staying one step ahead, if that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. So then has this been a problem that's just been increasing over time with the increasing sort of globalization of the world or has there you know been better protections obviously i guess if they're one step ahead it's it's hard to <laughs> hard to keep up then so that may suggest it is increasing but what's the current sort of analysis then on how this is progressing over time yeah i think that one of the scarier <laughs> kind of developments is that all of these drugs are getting a lot stronger. So for a long time, we were talking about um, sort of the opioid epidemic in terms of oxycodone and sort of the 90s when these, these drugs were coming out. And we just keep getting stronger and stronger with fentanyl. And then we have like isotonazine and these, you know, these specifically within opioids, uh, stronger and stronger medicines that have very, very small quantities 
lead to death, right? And so these will get mixed in with a Xanax, for instance, and undetectable to the human eye will be, will cause someone to die because they're taking a prescription that looks like a Xanax pill, but then it ends up having fentanyl in it and they end up dying. Um, and then again, back to the convergence, like we see a lot of this, um, criminal actors tend to work in tandem and along with one another. So we see uh, the convergence of, you know, for instance, fake Xanax, which is a really popular product, probably one of the most uh, popular anti-anxiety medications. And so we've seen users selling, and a lot of this is sold on social media, you're thinking your Facebooks, your TikToks, your, your Snapchats. And so we found one user selling counterfeit Xanax that was also selling counterfeit respirators. And then you'll often see this, the use of the same trade routes. So, um, you know, the same trafficking routes that are trafficking humans or weapons will, you know, they'll use those um, freight forwarders, those transport routes to, to traffic counterfeit medicines. So if, there, if people are selling these on like social media and just random websites or like on the internet, who exactly are the buyers of these products in countries around the world? Uh, because it, I mean, I, it would seem weird, obviously, if like some company was buying, you know, products on social media from <laughs> some counterfeit manufacturer or doctors or something like that. So like who's buying these and then how are they getting into like the medical systems in different countries? Yeah, so I think a lot of it is that that's the demand side is that uh, when we talk about treatment of chronic diseases, it's often a price point issue, like especially with antibiotics. It's people that are unable to buy through legitimate like pharmacies or to get those prescriptions or to visit, you know, a, a doctor to get that prescription. I think that there's also a lot of unknown unknowing purchasing, if I could say it that way, of these medicines. So, you know, um, it's very difficult for a consumer to, to distinguish if an online pharmacy is legitimate or not, because they try to do a really good job of looking to, you know, presenting themselves as an authorized distributor of these medicines. Um, they often will have very uh, shiny, um, kind of customer service, they allow, you know, refunds or exchanges, they promise really quick shipping, and so they do a really great job of advertising these, these medicines, and I think, again, it depends on what medicines we're talking about, so there's a lot of steroids or um, enhancement medications that happen, like the Viagra's, the steroids, we also have a lot of, like, diet medications that happen, so that it really depends on what market you're really looking at, um, and then again, with these, these synthetic uh, hallucinogens, a lot of these are like sort of lifestyle club drugs that are um, for the younger population, so to speak. Um, but because they are not well regulated, they, they lead to, you know, really horrible health repercussions and, and oftentimes death. Wow. Okay. So if someone around the world listening to this is like, in need of finding a drug online because for whatever reason they don't have access to it, um, but they're told by a medical prof professional that you know you're going to need this drug because you have some medical problem. What's the best way for them to go about buying it um, without buying some counterfeit thing that could you know get them killed? Yeah, so going through you know whatever established medical institutions that are in place in that that country or that city wherever they're located. So going through a legitimate pharmacy, again, going back to brands like your CVS or your Walgreens, these kinds of things where they really do regulate a lot of these medications, not just simply buying something online and trusting that because the marking or the coloring of the product looks like what they used to receive. So again, going back to who's buying them, these people might initially start um, getting the prescription from their doctor and then they say, oh, the cost is a little bit too high. Let's let me go online and purchase these medications. And I, I would really strongly advise to just not buy pharmacy, pharmaceuticals online at all unless that was you know, sort of authorized by your doctor. Because again, these counterfeiters are doing a great job of, um, for instance, one trend is a lot of packaging will come through Canada because 
for instance, in the American market, we think, oh, Canada, they have a more robust or um, better health care, public health care. Um, so when they package medicines as coming from Canada, everyone thinks, oh, well, that makes sense because Canada does a great job of, of giving, you know, um, providing medical attention to their, to their citizens. And so it looks less suspicious than if you saw a package coming from another country. Um, but yeah, I would definitely speak with a doctor and medical professional and then um, a pharmacist, for instance. And then in the case of um, if someone does purchase these products and they want to test them, there are several organizations out there that are willing and very much um, set up to help make sure that these are authentic products. So being able to test whatever you have to, to make sure that it's authentic. Yeah. So I guess, yeah, trying to buy discounted drugs online is not a good idea. Then. <laughs> yeah. Generally with counterfeits, we say if it looks too good to be true, price point, quantity, whatever it is, it probably is too good to be true. Right. And so that's another big red flag is to think if you were, per you know, just for an example, purchasing your prescription for $300 a month, and now all of a sudden you can find it for a hundred or $50 a month. That's a red flag. I mean, it's a great deal, but at what cost? Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, obviously, if, if you're struggling with the cost of some drug, that's just something that you have to figure out with your doctor or something, because that's something you can't, you can't cheat the system and buy discount one safely. So, um, have there been issues with uh, companies that manufacture uh yeah, like well-known companies that manufacture drugs accidentally purchasing ingredients for drugs that are sort of counterfeit or? Um, that's a good question. So I don't know about the, the manufacturers necessarily purchasing. Um, or big companies that sell these drugs out, like um, some pharmacies or something like that. Yeah, I definitely, like, so there have been cases where pharmacies have acquired medicines that um, may, again, have had, so when we talk about counterfeits, we have the active pharmaceutical ingredient, the API, and so a lot of this is, is product regulation, right? You need certain temperatures, there are certain conditions that the medicines must be stored in, just like, you know, think of the COVID-19 vaccines and how sensitive those were. To, to being transported. So there are definitely instances of pharmacies receiving, for instance, cancer medications or antibiotics or other medications that have been tampered with or improperly stored along with the supply chain that then deem them to be harmful. So they're not necessarily counterfeit again, they're, they've just been um, compromised, right? And they're substandard in some way, shape or form. Um, and then that also kind of brings in the role of legitimate companies in terms of trademark protection and the fact that a lot of counterfeiters will very blatantly use the trademark of these brands to bring legitimacy to their product, to make their product look like they're genuine. Um, and so we see a lot of that in terms of um, legitimate companies serving as a sort of shield for trade in counterfeit pharmaceuticals. Um, so the suppliers kind of on all levels operate the guy, a legitimate company, sell their list of medicines for extra income, and then they use it to expand their network. So it's sort of like a, so, um, like a cyclical process of the more that they can sell, the more that they can launder money and then beef up their business and kind of expand it. And then that all kind of feeds into, you know, this is very um, positive talk. But all of that kind of feeds into um, this, the role of the internet as well, right? And so being able to sell these, these on the internet, um, the high level of anonymity that the internet gives these producers and the sort of ease and sort of low barrier of entry or low barrier, I should say, to entry of being able to sell online. What's really kind of disheartening is that when we do detect and disrupt these networks, because especially lately since the pandemic, there's been such a rise in e-commerce, it's very easy for these actors to just set up shop again. So for instance, on social media, you see a user and they are selling, let's say counterfeit Xanax. Okay, well you flag that post and you take it down. Well, you know, user 
Sorry, Ben 101 just crops back up as Ben 102 the next day. Um, same thing with e-commerce platforms you know, or websites, for instance, because a lot of these are sold on standalone websites. And so a lot of our work is trying to detect the um, kind of the connection between a lot of these cyber vendors or these online vendors on the open web to see which websites are connected to other ones, because oftentimes we see as soon as something, it's the whack-a-mole problem, right? As soon as you, you stifle or stop the trade on one website, it just ends up transferring or shifting to an alternative site. That seems like uh, given how uh, invested human societies around the world are in, in the internet, it's, it's gonna be, there's gonna probably gonna be more and more funding being shifted towards you know, trying to counter things like that and, and, and trying to understand where they're coming from because it just seems like a, a never ending problem that's only going to grow because you can make so much money doing it. And there's so many ways to, to, you know, fake a product. Um, people are so good at it now. I mean, it's pretty, pretty out of control, it seems. Absolutely. <laughs> um, now you mentioned substandard drugs. I think that's kind of a, another interesting topic because though they're not fake, they're not, they're drugs that are not, you know, to the standard that the international medical community would like. How big of an issue is that around the world in different countries, especially countries that are not the wealthiest, for example? Is there an, a consistent problem with, with people trying to get access to drugs that are, you know, up to modern medical standards on a regular basis? Yeah, so I think that kind of um, really points to the intricacies of the scope of medicines. So again, like just to come back to the idea of like, what is a counterfeit medication? These are drugs that either contain no API, so no active pharmaceutical ingredient, so almost like an entire fake, um, an incorrect amount of that API. So we do see counterfeit medications that have some of the intended active ingredient, but just an incorrect amount, an inferior quality API, so a similar one, but it's not the, the right quality, um, ones that have contaminants or have been tampered with, you know, laced with fentanyl, or repackaged expired products, right? And so we do see this a lot um, with just packaging things as, as um, a product that they're not. We also see incorrectly uh, formulated and produced uh, products in substandard conditions. So it can also be like you were asking about before, what conditions are these made under, right? So instead of being in a very highly regulated lab, we have these sort of like, drug dens essentially that are producing or manufacturing these products in, you know, I wouldn't want to take a medication that was produced in, in a rural um, den or, right. or facility. Right. Um, but yeah, generally these type of drugs or medications or pharmaceutical items which are produced or sold with the intent to deceptively represent its origin, authenticity, or effectiveness. And I think it's also important to point out that this can apply to both generic and branded drugs. So it's no drug is is immune from being uh, counterfeit. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's so much that goes into producing a drug, you know, appropriately that there's so many ways it can be messed up and tampered with. I mean, I, I remember from just interacting with people that you know, serve at like US embassies around the world, where if you talk to some medical doctors at US embassy stationed in a a country that you know isn't all that wealthy is kind of lower middle income that they may not even trust the local pharmacies from those countries because uh, you know there's issues with drugs just not being up to international standards. Um, and then you really think about the populations that live there on a regular basis and what drugs they're taking and if they're getting the medical you know drugs they need. It just seems like here in like the U.S., for example, we're worried about drugs coming into the country that, you know, could contaminate supply chains that are not up to standards, but then there's people every day living in countries that may not have, on a regular basis, drugs that are up to international standards. It just seems like a such a huge problem um, internationally, but a really, really big problem in, in certain countries around the world. Yeah, absolutely. And you bring up a really great point of like at the sort of micro level of individuals who sort of fall victim to this low quality counterfeit products. 
um, that don't meet their medical needs, but it's not just that there's this very direct health impact, there's also this sort of social economic impact of a loss of trust or confidence in healthcare professionals, in health programs, in health systems, for instance. And just you said like, I'm gonna mention particular countries, but like just not trusting the pharmacy that you're going to. Like you ask the question, well, where should you go to get your medicines that's a trusted source? And it should be your pharmacy. But right. when your pharmacies right. are being sort, you know, getting um, products that are sourced that are substandard or have been tampered with or have not been properly regulated, then you start to lose trust in those institutions. And that's when you start to get into these sort of broader problems of not trusting healthcare facilities, in addition to the fact that you're failing to cure or prevent future diseases, um, especially during the, the pandemic, we start to, to see a lot of like antimicrobial resistance and drug resistance infections. Um, and then again, like just increasing out of pocket health costs and a loss of income due to prolonged illness or death, like all of this sort of self perpetuates because you know, ideally we're all healthy and we don't necessarily need medications to go about our daily lives and work and do the things that we need to do to have a productive economy. Um, so again, it sort of becomes this cyclical problem of if we don't trust the healthcare, like if we could get ahead of it and have more preventative um, medical services, we may not need so many of these medications in an ideal world. Yes, that's right, yeah. Yeah, a lot, lot of issues uh, to deal with, but hopefully the international community can can work on it together and and help improve it. And if someone is in a situation where I guess they, you know, are not too sure about how how great their local pharmacy is, I guess it's really important then to find a doctor that you can trust that can recommend, you know, uh, the right products that you need and give you access to them somehow. It's it's kind of a mess, I guess it can be, depending on where you are, but just do the best you can, I suppose. Um, so shifting gears a little bit, what are you currently working on? So a lot of it is looking at um, pharmaceuticals, illicit pharma, but also just generally looking at medical products and counterfeits during COVID-19. Mm -hmm. So we are looking at counterfeit respirators more specifically. Uh, and we, I'm happy to report that with our sort of pri private public partnership between George Mason University, which is where TRAC, Terrorism, Transnational Crime and Corruption Center is based, and um, 3M, we've successfully been able to prevent over 55 million counterfeit respirators from entering legitimate supply chains. This is a global figure. And these are respirators, so think you're like N95 masks that were intended for legitimate supply chains, including hospitals, frontline healthcare workers. And so you can see why this would be a huge problem when the protective equipment that has been given out to our frontline or our front, you know, our healthcare workers is be is substandard because they're the ones that are at the forefront of trying to stop the spread of the virus. Um, we've also taken down. I believe over 50,000 deceptive or fraudulent e-commerce listings, um, which is really important because again, with this prevalence of the online market, that's something we really want to kind of tackle and look at. Um, and then again, looking at all these uh, counterfeit pharmaceuticals, mostly on the open web. And again, looking at the convergence of these with cyber crime, financial crimes that sort of facilitate all of this, um, one really, I think, interesting kind of development is that in our conversation, I feel like we're, we're saying, okay, like it's really easy to go online and social media, website, wherever it might be, and purchase these, these counterfeit products. But there's a whole other sector of sort of cybercrime that comes along with this where criminals will put up these advertisements as non-delivery scams. And so they're not, they don't, they may never have, they may not have the product that they're promising. They're just asking Ben to click on a bunch of things and put his credit card information onto the into the website so that they can collect that information. And so you never end up actually getting said product. They just are using your social security number or your you know, credit card, any sort of personal identifiable information 
to be able to commit financial crimes online. And so that's a big surge as well when we look at COVID-19, especially with sort of vulnerable populations in terms of like the elderly that are not as used to purchasing products online. They're extremely susceptible to these kinds of crimes because you know, all it takes is like one false click or bad click to get you into an area of the internet where a lot of your like banking information is being taken down. And so that really points to um, just being a responsible digital consumer, if that makes sense, um, and knowing where your information is. And again, like go to your pharmacy, go to your doctor to get your medications, but also be very, very careful where you're storing and inputting any of this kind of like credit card or banking information online. Yeah, there seems like there's just countless ways for people to take advantage of you online if you're not careful. It's uh, kind of the, seems like the wild west almost with with things. There's just so many things that can happen now online and obviously so many different illegal transactions that can happen. Um, but, and I think a lot of it is unknowing consumption too. I mean, yeah. Um, Part of the work that we're doing now, and we'll have a book launch on February 21st for the Antiquity Smuggling Project, I, I genuinely feel as though some people that are buying these coins or cuneiform or statuettes on the internet are not intending to fund terrorism or other forms of transnational crime. They're just really excited about cultural heritage and they want to hold a piece of history in their hand, but then they're buying like Etsy, actually, we found to be a really big platform for selling um, counterfeit coins or um, illicit coins or cuneiform. Um, and so I think that consumers are going on these sites and they just, they get excited and they want to purchase the product, but they don't really think of the ramifications or the sourcing of where that comes from. In particular, the antiquity, we have a lot of, a lack of provenance, meaning like the ownership history, like where the product actually came from. And again, just like with pharmaceuticals, a lot of falsifying of where those, those products came from. And so I think generally, whatever you're consuming, whether it's medicines or antiquities or like your clothing or food, the more that consumers can be aware of where those products are sourced from, the better. And I think um, to point out a particular example, there's a certain company called Amazon that a lot of people are buying products from and I don't, I think that there's a really, uh, a lack of awareness of, of how Amazon really serves as an intermediary. And again, how complex that whole supply chain is. Because I think a lot of people are thinking that the products that they buy on Amazon are manufactured and produced and shipped and all of like the whole supply chain is provided by Amazon. And that's not true. And a lot of times you'll see listings where they'll use brand names and be very convincing in the way that they're selling the product. And that's not, not necessarily true. So the more that people can consciously consume online and buy, I would say, as close to the source as possible, the better. Yeah, the, I, I've definitely kind of noticed that as well on, on Amazon. It seems like more and more products are being listed from companies based not in the U.S. or yeah, you know, it seems like a lot of products or most tons of products from China up here have been popping up on Amazon lately, and you just never know what you're getting. Um, and yeah, it seems like there has been quite a quite a lot of of uh, of new things popping up on Amazon that is not what Amazon, I guess, used to sell. Um, it seems like there's just a, a far more things that are not really what you would expect. And you could just look just by seeing, okay, who's the seller? And you can usually figure out, okay, where's the, where's the source of it? But I think that a lot of people, you're right, are not paying attention to that at all. And just say, okay, it's Amazon, so everything on here must be legitimate. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm definitely far more concerned about buying things on Amazon than I, than I was before just from looking on, on the website. Um, yeah, it just seems like there's yeah, a lot less trustworthy things there, so... Absolutely. And it's and not to just pick on Amazon. So another interesting example is uh, Wish, which is another kind of e-commerce platform. And excuse me, recently, um, France is trying to essentially ban Wish because a lot of, especially during the um, holiday season at the end of 2021, I think it was 90 or 95 percent of the electronics and, and children's toys that they found were non-compliant, right? So they're 
wow. somehow dangerous, could be harmful to the child. You know, a lot of, we see a lot of this in, um, you know, looking at counterfeiting more broadly, like automotive products, um, toys, electronics is a big area where things are being counterfeit. And so, um, again, yeah, just making sure that things are closer you can buy it from the source, the better, and just not necessarily trusting these um, larger e-commerce sites. And also just knowing what, uh, this kind of comes back to traceability of the supply chain, if that makes sense. So the more that we have transparency in what is happening in these supply chains, the better. And so, you know, the use of barcodes, the use of um, particular lot numbers. So like for instance, 3M has done an excellent job of informing consumers about what particular lot codes of respirators tend to be counterfeit. The CDC, um, FDA, depending on what sector we're talking about, have all, you know, if you're ever curious, there's plenty of resources out there as well. The internet can also be a great place for information to yeah. make sure that you're, you know, and, and I, I'm doing it myself with, you know, um, certain products and going through the checklist of what, you know, what a respirator should be doing or what the marking should be or what, what would be a red flag that might let you know that uh, a product is false. And then at the end of the day, you can always contact the manufacturer or the original seller because they will, again, they're the subject matter experts and you can take pictures and send it to them and say, hey, I bought this product. I don't, you know, maybe it wasn't, maybe it wasn't yours or is it counterfeit or is it somehow illegitimate? Yeah, it's always, always good to be extra careful since there's <laughs> lots of ways to get it fooled. And I think the, I think the bigger a, a e-commerce company gets, I think the the harder it has in terms of, or I guess the the bigger issues it has when it comes to regulating what they're selling. I think as Amazon has gotten bigger or as other companies have gotten bigger, they just struggle to figure out, okay, who's selling products on our platform and are these products, <laughs> should they be on here in the first place? I'm just, I think same thing with like social media pages, you get more and more fake profiles popping up as your thing gets more popular because naturally people trying to scam people are going to go towards platforms that um, ha are popular, so. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that that's, so not to pick on any one particular, you know, sector or place like we did, we mentioned e-commerce platforms, a lot of criticism is being um, put against social media platforms like Facebook, for instance, which yeah. actually, you know, they reacted in terms of antiquities and they did ban the selling of um, historic, historical artifacts on the site. But again, that takes a lot of subject matter expertise to just know what is um, a counterfeit or illicit antiquity. Um, but I think one kind of layer of all this that gets missed is the payments community, right? Because None of these transactions are going to happen without credit cards, your Visa MasterCards, your banking yeah. systems. And so I think that that, for me lately, has been a constructive way forward. So absolutely working with e-commerce platforms, working with social media platforms, but also looking at the payments community and making these payments a little bit less frictionless. So we see a lot of third-party cash transfer apps um, that that facilitate these financial transactions. And so, you know, since we're naming brands here, you know, you're like PayPal's or your Venmo's, your um, cash apps. And a lot of those are very frictionless. And what I mean by that is that there's very little information that's collected about the individual, depending on the, on the payment pl platform, um, but getting them involved because being able to kind of regulate these online transactions helps with, researchers like myself or investigators through law enforcement or customs to be able to track the actual financial transactions, right? Like we say, follow the money to be able to, to stop these crimes. And it's really important to be able to, to do that, to be able to detect and disrupt these trades. Yeah, that makes total sense but since they're in the middle of all of this. So, <laughs> so mm -hmm. you think that they would have a role to play in this as well. Um, but yeah. yeah, and they do, and I think we're we're hopefully doing a good job partnering with them and everything. And again, this comes back to promoting sort of private public partnerships and and generally just sort of having transparency of supply chains, but also transparency of data, because understandably so, due to privacy concerns and um, and concerns of their kind of responsibility to their customers, 
a lot of this data is very sensitive, but building those partnerships and building that trust and showing that we can use this sort of data sharing and transparency and collaboration to seize over 55 million counterfeit respirators, like showing actual tangible results, I think will hopefully encourage others to work with us as well. Definitely. That would be ideal. So, well, before I let you go, what is the best way for people to keep track of all your work and research? Yeah, uh, so I would definitely visit TRAC's website, which is traccc.gmu.edu. Uh, you can find me on Twitter, at the handle Tokyo Ming. Um, I'm also on all the social media platforms that I mentioned, but I also um, own laymay.com if you want to follow that. As I mentioned, we have the book on antiquity smuggling in the real and virtual world that just came out with Roy Lidge in January. And so we will have a book launch on February 21st, 2022 at 10 a.m. Eastern. Um, so you can come check us out there. Um, I presented a lot of different political science, mostly uh, conferences. And so I'd be happy to follow up with anyone who's interested in learning more about my work or the work that I do at TRAC. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for coming on and, and thank you for all the work that you do. There definitely is a huge need, obviously, for people trying to combat illicit trade around the world. So I'm glad that people like you are out there on the front lines battling this. So, um, and uh, yeah, lots to look forward to. Sounds like there's all sorts of great stuff to keep track of you on. So perfect. Thank you so much, Ben. Thanks for having me and thanks for your podcast. And I look forward to hopefully speaking with you again. Absolutely.